Hi, my name is Terry Ryan and I'm running for Congress. Today Congress is broken. We need to elect problem solvers to get down to Washington and solve the, the problems that we're facing today. People that know me know me that I'm, that I'm a collaborator and I work to solve problems. And when I'm elected to Congress, I will do exactly that. I will work to solve problems. A little bit about me. I was born in Lowell, born and raised in Lowell. My parents were middle class parents. My father was an engineer. My mother was a Lowell public school teacher in the Highlands in Senegal. They instilled in me a tremendous work ethic and a commitment to public service. And that's what I've lived my life every day, giving back to the community. I've spent 30 years, close to 30 years in the, public, in the public and private industry. I've worked for companies like Raytheon, Lucent Technologies, and just recently I was director of the Small Business Center at Community Teamwork. I've worked in both of these. I've been a collaborator and I've worked to solve problems. I'm also a member of the Westford School Committee. As such, I work with school budgets, working with parents, on a day-to-day -day basis. We spend a lot of time on the education of the children and the safety of our children in our schools. When I'm elected, I will go down to Washington and I will work hard for the 3rd District. The district that I've lived in, I've worked in, and I've served my entire life. I'll go down to Washington, I'll roll up my sleeves, and I'll get the job done. Thank you very much. Good morning, Terry. Um, well, I want to welcome you to the Sun um, as you as you launch your bid for Congress. We've been we've been doing these Sun editorial board meetings for about a month and a half now. I think you're the fourth or the fifth candidate in. So I want to welcome you to the Sun. Thank you very much, Chris. You Thank you, Jim. Chris. So, Thank you very much. It's great to be here this morning, and uh, I look forward to the questions. But you have t tell us a little bit about tell us right about your background. Oh, so, and, uh, your run, your so, background and, and, uh, so my background is uh, I was born in Lowell, uh, born and raised in Lowell. My parents, uh, my father was an engineer. My mother was a Lowell public school teacher. Uh, I've always lived in the district. I've always worked in the district, and I've always served in some capacity or another in the district. Uh, I have close to thirty years experience in the high tech industry, private industry. Uh, at companies like Raytheon and Lucent Technologies. I uh, just recently worked for Community Teamwork. Uh, I was the director of the Small Business Center and the focus of that was to help the small businesses within the Merrimack Valley uh, start and expand small businesses. So I worked a lot with low-income, moderate-income folks through CTI to help these people start businesses and some of those businesses are right here on Merrimack Street, uh, some are in Lawrence, some are in Haverhill. Uh, so throughout the district, you know, I've been able to help small businesses uh, grow, expand, and get through some of the struggles that they have as a small business. Um, I've always been a problem solver. I've always been a collaborator. I've been able to get the job done in private industry, and I've been able to get the job done as a member of the school committee. I've been on the Westwood School Committee for six years, and I'm currently the chairman. So, you know, I understand budgets from a private business and, uh, perspective, and I understand the crafting of budgets at the school and the town level. So I think that's very important. And, and just to say, you know, the schools went through a horrific, you know, day yesterday. And as a parent, you know, that's my worst fear. Something like that happening in my children's school district. I have three school-age children. And, and just watching the scenes on TV and the terror that those kids went through, uh, absolutely terrible. As a member of the school committee, it's the worst thing that could have ever happen. And we work very hard to make the schools safe. We're constantly reviewing protocol, procedures, improvements to the schools. What can we do to make the schools safer? You know, when kids go to school, they should feel safe. And their parents should know that their children are going into a safe environment. Okay? That's very important. But I, I, I think when when I look towards going to Congress, absolutely this has to be a focus. There's no need for these kind of guns on the street of America. 
There is no need for an A4, A, whatever it's called, an AR-15. AR-15. AR-15 to be out there. There's no need for that in society. And I will absolutely work to get those off the street, guns similar to that. And I, I really believe that. And when you see that there, there have been 430 kids or something killed since Connecticut, you know, that's ridiculous. We, 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 we're a country that's better than that. So we can do better. Uh, just to get back to, you know, I'm running because I, th I think I can go to Washington and I can work with people. I've collaborated with people. Like I said in the schools, I have 5,000 kids. I don't care if their families are Democrats, Republicans, or Independents. At the end of the day, I'm fighting for what's good for the kids and what helps them to succeed. So when I go to Washington, I'll take that attitude. I want to work across the aisle, like I have done, and continue to make progress. You know, I, I, I want to be able to walk into the room the day I'm sworn in and shake everybody's hands, meet, meet them, tell them who I, I am, listen to who they are. You know, we all have families. We all have parents that are getting older. You know, we all have the same problems. But we have to get into a room and sit there and talk about the problems and not come in and just say, he's the enemy, I'm not going to talk to him. You know, you're not going to change your mind. You know, we can get there by getting 75% of what we need. You know, if we can get 75%, if the other side can get what they need, you know, we can work together and we have to get back to that. You know, and I know other candidates have said that, but I firmly believe I've done that. Terry, do you think you'd be running if there wasn't an open seat? I would not have run against Nikki Songus. Uh, she's done a wonderful job for the district, and I personally didn't know she was retiring until I saw it in the paper that day. Uh, and that's what kicked us off. Uh, we, we, you know, my wife and I talked about it. It's a big decision. It's, it's, it's a big uh, job to run for Congress. Uh, we've discussed it, and you know, we see. And now that we have a management team on board, we we have. The people working with us, we have a strategy, we have a plan, and I believe we have a path forward to winning this election. You know, there are some big names in the race, um, and there are some big names that have raised a lot of money. Um, in all due respect, um, I don't put you quite up there. You haven't raised that kind of money. So do you think this is a really big bite of the apple for you? My strategy, my plan is never to raise a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't agree with the fact that you should raise millions of dollars to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. You should be able to raise an adequate amount of money to get your message out and to reach the people that you know that will vote for you. I don't know how you go to Congress and fight for the people of the district and dock money and money in Congress and money in politics when you've been elected by raising millions of dollars. I see that as a problem. I, I want to raise the amount of money that gets my message out, and I think I have a way of doing that. And I certainly believe that I will raise money, and I know that you have to raise money. Mm -hmm. And I have a budget in mind, and now that I'm not working full time, my focus will be 100% on my campaign that will end on September 4th with me getting the Democratic nomination. Just a quick follow up then, I'll, I'll, the other guys can go. Um, how much do you think you have to raise to get your message out? Not a million dollars. I think I can do it. You know, I, I live in the district. I don't have to buy the district. I'm not out there trying to flood the district uh, with a message that I'm moving in here, I'm doing this. I've lived here, I've worked here. I've served here, I know the district, and I think that's what the district deserves, is somebody that's, you know, that knows the ups and downs of the city of Lowell for the past 20 years. Somebody that went to high school in Lawrence and has worked with business owners in Lawrence, and who sees what good things are happening in Lawrence now, the improvements that are made, the, the mills that are being uh, rehabbed, and the businesses moving to Lawrence, and the focus on Lawrence, and Haverhill, you know, the working cities. I've been involved with the working cities here in Lowell. Mm -hmm. and, and the plans that we're, we're, we're working on and what we're trying to do in the acre, I know that. I, I've lived with the acre. You know, I, I, 
you know, growing up, there's always been the Coalition for a Better Acre, and, you know, I've worked with those folks now. So these terms and these groups aren't new to me. They're, they're names that I've lived with, and the people that have run the city and worked in the city, like Paul Songus and, and um, you know, all of the politicians that have been in the city and have done great things for the city, the delivery system over the years. You know, I grew up with that, and I remember that. And, you know, that's important to the people of Lowell. The people of Lowell want somebody that they can relate to, that they can talk to, and it's, you know, I'm very approachable. Uh, and, and I think that's what the people of the city want, and I think that's what the people of the district want. You know, I'm not the flashy guy, I'm not the most eloquent guy in the room. But you know what? I can roll my sleeves up and I can get the job done. I've done it working at Raytheon and resolving problems there for technical issues. I've done it communication-wise, working at Lucent. I can do it in Congress. And I look forward to that. I look forward to going down there every Monday morning and staying until the job is done. Okay? Um, so when Nikki Sangas announced that she would not be seeking re-election, what pushed you into the race? What, obviously, you weren't thinking about it before, uh, she announced her resignation, but what pushed you over the edge and said, you know what, I'm going to take my shot? Uh, was it the Trump election? Was it what's going on? I mean, what was it? If something had to motivate you to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going into When you grow up in law, you serve. You give of your time. When you grow up in law, you give of your time. You serve. And you serve, you give back to your community. I've always been taught that. I've always had an interest in that. And, you know, to see that and just say, this is an opportunity, you know, not for greatness uh, or, or anything like that. It's an opportunity to serve the district. It's an opportunity to take what I've learned at these companies and understand how companies work and how they, how they provide jobs to the community. And, and, it takes, and, and it's an opportunity for me to take what I've learned at CTI and say, these programs work. These programs that are in place by the federal government are actually helping people down on Merrimack Street. And they're helping people in the city, and they're helping people in the cities of Haverhill, and Fitchburg, and Marlborough. We are helping people. And when I read about programs being cut that directly affect people, it makes me proud to run as a Democrat and say, I support these programs, and I want these programs to continue. Can I, can I hop in here? I just want to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, you're running a lot on your background, your connections to the district. Compared to some of the other candidates, you don't have as much hands-on experience in state or national politics. How do you think you can close that gap, and why should voters believe that someone with six years of school committee experience is better than someone who was a chief of staff to the congressman from this district for 10 years? Well, I, I think you have to look at, you know, what I've actually, you know, I'm out there every day, and, you know, I wasn't a chief of staff to a congressman for any period of time. But, you know, that's a job that, you know, somebody was paid to do. I was paid to work at Raytheon for 30 years. I was paid to work at Lucent. I did my job. But at the end of the day, I also went out and I served. I did extra things. I gave back to the community outside of my job. Okay, I think that's very important. And as a member of the school committee, similar to a chief of staff, when somebody calls me, I'm going to return that call and I'm going to get back to that person. But it's because I put my name on the ballot. I took the time to put my name on a ballot and run. I've put my name out there and I've always said this since I've run. I ran for the vote back in 95, the Greater Low Vote, and I lost. A great experience. You have to look that election up. <laughs> look that up. It was a great election. And look up what happened after it. It's a great story. Uh, but, you know, everybody should put their name on a ballot at some point in their life. It's, it's an, you know, it, it's just an eye-opener to have your name on a ballot and to have to stand up in front of people and talk to people and give your views and opinions. I think, you know, I've done that and I think that's, that's a big part of the job. It can be school committee, it can be board of selectmen, it can be senate. Y'all putting your name out there, y'all putting your family out there. I think that's, that's a very important thing. Uh, 
I, I really appreciated that, you know, Chris asked for resumes and wanted to know job histories and where you work. I think that's very important to look at the candidates and say, what did these people really do and when did they really do it? So I think that's, that's important. I think it's good to get a good background on all of the candidates, where we come from, and what we do have offered to this, to this uh, the congressional seat. I can go right down there and I, I can go work on, you know, defense-related issues because I know how missile defense works. I understand it. What did you do at Raytheon, by the way? So I was primarily in the quality group, but I worked on Patriot radars. I've actually been down to White Sands, New Mexico, crawled around the Patriot missile systems. Uh, but overall, it was quality position, so I was responsible for various positions of quality on various missile systems. In Raytheon and Andover, I worked in Lowell, I've worked on Stinger missiles, which are the hand uh, the shoulder mount missiles, I've worked on those, so various missile radar systems. So what does that mean that we worked on quality? What, I, I, Product I, I, quality. You're not an engineer, right? I am. I am an engineer. Okay. I have an electrical engineering okay. degree, I have an MBA. Okay. And uh, so, specifically, Parts of the missile would fail a test. Yeah. You know, my responsibility would be to work with the technicians involved to troubleshoot that failure down to a, you know, a specific part component, mm -hmm. get a root cause analysis done on that, why did that part fail, and then feed that back up the line to the product, you know, the component engineers, and make improvements to that component so that failure would not happen again. Basically, in a nutshell, I've worked on process improvement programs. So I'm familiar with, you know, running into a problem, looking at the process, resolving the issue, and making sure that that problem does not occur again. Because, you know, when you're talking missiles, you're talking life and death situations. So you need to resolve the issue and make sure it doesn't happen again. Tell me, just going back to the, uh, the, the Florida shooting which occurred Excuse yesterday, me. which um, 17 uh, people, including children, were killed, um, so, you know, we've had in the past year we've had a congressman who was shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that didn't move Congress. One of their own was shot. That didn't move Congress to 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 eradicate you know some of these guns out there. Uh, now you've got uh, eighteen shootings since January first this year involving schools in America. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. You go down to Congress. What is the difference that you're going to make? How are you going to? What is the new, the new way to try to approach this issue? Is it? See, it seems to me like both sides want it all, and neither wants to start somewhere. Like maybe just get rid of the AK-47. No, the extremists on both ends say it's either all or nothing at all. So that's what appears to me. I could be wrong, but. How are, you, how are you going to change this? I mean, what do you, what, what do, you do? The action has to be taken some way. Is there some new vision, some new way to, to do this as, as opposed to sa the same, you know, the same arguments on both sides that really don't amount to anything? That doesn't. I mean, yeah. congressmen have been shot themselves. It's a great right question. It's a, you know, <laughs> how does it stop? You know? So, um, so yeah. what, 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 I mean, adding your voice to it, I mean, how are you going to change it? I mean, the first I'm, thing we do, is we get, you know, the Democrats get voted into the House. We take control of the House. Without that, you know, nothing gets done. We're, we're, we need to get Democratic uh, members of Congress elected in this next election. That has to be a priority, okay? The next priority is we have to sit in a room. You know, we have to sit down. We have to be able to talk about this. You cannot be pointing fingers at each other, walking in the room and just agreeing not to disagree. Yeah, agreeing to just, you, you, we have to work to change minds, okay? And you know what? I'm not going to get everything I want, you know? And that's how it works. But you know what? I have to expect that the guy on the other side of the aisle is not going to get everything he wants. So we have to agree to that, okay? So now, we're not going to get everything we want. I shouldn't expect that. But you know what? I should expect a conversation. And that's why I come back to day one. I want to talk with these congressmen. I want to build a relationship. I want to know what makes them tech. They should know what makes me tech. And so when we get to a position when we're in a room and we're trying to decide something, I know whether he's whether he or she, I know where they're coming from. Okay? I know where the, I know their history. I know why they're standing and making that discussion.
But on the same, on the same level, he needs to know where I'm, where I'm coming from. And we have to get to the point. You know, what does it take? A congress being, congress person being shot. How many kids have to die before we, we, before we sit down? We are a country of people. It should be our decision. The, the people that are elected to Congress and Senate need to govern. They're elected to govern. We need to govern. When I get down to Congress, I will work to govern. I'm not looking at the next election. I'm not looking at the next uh, fundraiser. I want to get down there and govern. We need to stop this. We need to, you know, there is no need, there is no way that anybody can tell me that these guns belong in society. There's nothing anybody can okay. say. But I will listen. I We're will in a listen. room together. Yep. Okay, you are now the Senate majority, the, the House Speaker, <laughs> Democrats, House Speaker, and I'm the minority leader, okay, for the minority party, the Republicans or the anarchists, whoever they are, okay? So, you say to me, I want this, take all these guns out, and I said, okay, I'll get my people to go vote with you, Terry. We'll get rid of all the guns, but I want border security. I want a wall. Do you say, gee, okay, we can agree to that. Oh, no, my principles, blah, 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 because of the border wall, what it stands for. Nope, nope, I'm not going for that, okay? So how do we get this deal done if those are the two options? Are they just separate? And, and, and see, this is what's happening. Yeah, that's what happens. This is what happens. Okay, someone wants something for something. Now it's always been done since 1770, well, 1789. Okay, <laughs> it's always been done, but somehow we've lost this this balance. Now maybe it is. Uh, is it a principle of yours as a Democrat that you either get, you know, one thing that means so much to you, and you can't bargain away the other thing? I mean, just just take this. Do you to make that deal? Do you make that deal? I want to sit down with you on a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this. I don't want to sit down with people staring at you and, 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 and looking at me. You and I should have a civil conversation about this. And, and why do you want the wall? What are the options to the wall? What are options to my guns? You know, what is, what is the deal that we can make that you can get, you know, better security along the border, hmm. okay? Better security. And, and I don't really, the wall isn't the answer. When you look at the 2,000 miles that we have to build and $21 million a mile, some crazy number like that, with the terrain that you are talking, it's not a wall. We're not Germany, East Germany. We're not people that put up walls, okay? Better security? Absolutely. Let's talk about that. Excuse me for just a minute, and to, to, my, to my boss's point, we've been consistent in asking all the candidates this. If you had been at the table that day with Trump and all the congressional leaders, would you have accepted the wall in, uh, for, the, for the, uh, the dreamers being allowed into the country? I am not in favor of the wall. So you would not have taken that deal? I would not have taken okay. that deal. Okay. Okay. We don't, we're not a country of walls. Okay? We're a country, we should be a country of security and protect us citizens, a wall does not do that in any way, shape, or form. Back to the guns, we need to continue that conversation. We need to discuss what guns we're talking about. How do we get them off the market? How, what do we do? What do we do for background checks? You know, everybody's in favor of background checks for weapons, but we just can't seem to get there. Okay, we need to get better at protecting the people from guns. We need to do Make sure that people who shouldn't have guns cannot buy guns, okay? This kid from Florida yesterday, how did he get the gun? You know, how did he get a gun like that? You know, that's what we have to look into. But, you know, I want to sit down. I want to talk to you. I want to know why you're so, you know, you think the wall is the best answer. In this day and age, why can't we have a virtual type of security system that's in place? You know, we have satellite systems. We can track things. We don't need to build a wall. People will climb a wall. People will go under a wall. Okay? That's not the answer. Security and for our citizens and an overall immigration plan that covers the wall, sanctuary cities, DACA. We need a comprehensive immigration plan that provides pathways to citizenship and provides security to our country. Terry, where do you stand on sanctuary cities? Sanctuary cities, you know, it's really up to the city. 
uh, you know, I'm not going to make that decision. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to see local police pulling people over and holding them waiting for federal agents. I, don't, I think that crosses the line. Okay, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, we need to, as far as sanctuary cities, you know, studies have shown that like the people that live in sanctuary cities, undocumented immigrants, they're going to school, they're getting educations, they're working, they're actually, you know, people in the community that you want. They're working in their communities to make them better. They live, you know, they live in the community, they're working, okay? If, if there is a criminal element, yes, we absolutely remove them. We can get them out. But I, I believe in part of the comprehensive immigration step strategy, we have to provide multiple paths to citizen, citizenship. We have 11 million people undocumented in the country. What's their path? Okay? What's the path for those living in sanctuary cities? What's the path for those living uh, the dreamers? Okay? We made a commitment to the dreamers. We should follow through. Okay? And we should work with, once again, compromise. How do we talk about their families? How do we get the path? You know, the individual path. It's not all black and white. There are variations to the path to citizenship. We're all, you know, we're all immigrants. We all came here from different countries for one reason or another. It's no different today. All right, so we, we, we create this path for 11 million, we accept them, all 11 million, all 800,000 doctor people. We have a reset, okay? How do we go forward? What's, what do you do with the border? What do you do with immigration? What do you do with people, vetting people coming into this country? What do you do about a national ID card that was put in the 9-11 report by a bipartisan commission? That this is what this country needs to actually create a better security system for the citizens of the United States. So what's the reset button? What, where do we go from there? Do we continue this same thing that every 10 years we're going to have to look at this issue and give more people asylum? Because that's basically what it is for those 11 million people. Okay. So the reset button is here. Terry Ryan's in Congress. Yep. Where do we go forward? What is our new immigration It's not problem? a reset. It's a path. They have to work for their citizenship. Oh, so they have just to follow them. So they can just flow no. over the border. No. I don't want people flowing in. There has to be an orderly process. That always has been, you know, an orderly process for immigrants coming into this country. We ignore it now. You know what? Because that is because we don't govern. We don't have people in Congress that are looking five, six, ten years <coughs> down the road. We, this isn't a problem that you solve in the next term. This is an issue that is a long-term resolution. We need to come up with the short-term goals. What are the short-term goals? Okay, resolve the DACA issue. Let's resolve the dream, the, the DACA. Let's, you know, put the wall aside once and for all. Let's make a decision, put that aside, okay? But we need short-term goals, we need long-term <coughs> goals. All of that you mentioned, a long-term comprehensive immigration plan. You know, I don't have the staff to look at that right now and understand the, the, the scope of that. But you know what? Congress does. Congress has, if they had the vision, if they had the wherewithal to govern and stand up for this country and, and, and come up with a plan that works. And only that only works is if you come back to what I've said. You get in a room and you talk. Okay? It all comes back to that. We can't govern if we're not talking to each other. Okay. Oh, Tom? Excuse me. Or Chris? Uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to get into the other 800-pound um, gorilla, which is health care. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that is is there universal health in Medicare for all? Where are you on that? So we have ACA. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a solid structure foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, we can work with that for now. We can make improvements to that. It it comes back to what I've just said: short term goals, long term goals. You know, we can make improvements to healthcare mm -hmm. the way we have it, looking down the road to other plans that we may want to incorporate, single payer, other items, mm -hmm. you know. But we need to work with what we have right now, make improvements on efficiencies, we can make efficient we can make changes in the short term to make to make 
the plan better than it is today. But you don't go into Washington and say, let's throw that out, come up, come up with something. You know? how, how practical is that given the current administration, which has been... Once again, it comes away. back to, yeah. we need to elect Democrats mm -hmm. in 2018. We need to take the House. We need to make changes. If we don't do that, and, and the Republicans uh, are running the House and Senate further on, nothing will happen, and we'll have these bills that are forced upon us, like the tax bill and things like that, that you know, we really can't push back on. Okay, so we need to focus on health care, make the improvements, the short term that actually, actually help the people in the cities and towns and also have the long term view. What are we going to do long term? How are we going to help people? You know, I read in the paper, you know, the meals in the boxes. Is, is that what we want to get to is provide instead of providing food stamps and things like that to people, we're going to provide meals of canned vegetables and fruits and canned meat to people, that's not, where we, that's not where we should be as a country either. That's not where we are. You know, we're a country, we're pushing healthy fruits and vegetables on our kids. We don't serve a box at night through the government. So what you do to bring the Democrat Party back in line with the people, and it seems like there's an opportunity for them to do it. What do they stand for? I mean, what should be the three? If, if you're in Congress and you had to get up on your soapbox and say, these are the three things we should focus on as a Democratic Party, or I want to focus on. My what first one, be? collaboration, communication. You know, 2018, the next election, we have to get on there. We need to start the conversations. We need to move forward. After that, you know, my focus is, the, you know, jobs. <coughs> My focus is education, based on that. You know, education, jobs, and health care. They're the three things, they're the bread and butter that make this country move. Okay? Without an education, you know, you can't move forward. We need, we need to look at education as the backbone of what we do. We, our, our people need to be educated. You know, we need to move forward and... Well, how do you lower tuition costs? That seems to be a that seems to be a major obstacle for a lot of people uh, to get higher education. At least that's what we're hearing. So right, and I'd like to look at you know how do we make private education cheaper, like the big universities, big endowments. You know, can we do something there? As far as public schools and public colleges, I'd like to look at what New York and California are doing, and and absolutely look at you know can we move to a place where community colleges are a lower cost or are free. And how do we do that? You know, do I have a plan to do that right now? No. But that's absolutely something you look at. When you look at, you know, Middlesex Community College, you know, they do great things. And, and their, their, their uh, enrollments are starting to get down. Okay, what can we do to get people into that school? What can we do to give an education to somebody that really wants it but just can't get there, that just doesn't have the money to get there. So, um, should a community it, college be free? Excuse me. I would love to work towards that. I absolutely think that's something we can do. You know, the, the programs in place at the community colleges where kids can go there for a couple of years and then transfer those credits to U Lowell or you know UMass Lowell or UMass Amherst. That's a wonderful way. For for a person to get a great education at a much lower cost. So I would love to, if we could do uh, lower cost, a no cost community college, absolutely. They're in the cities, that's where the people are. It's very important that we do look at that. Is single payer health care the way to go? Not today. Not today. Not today. But you in favor of looking at it, or are you in favor of single payer health care? I'm in favor of looking at it as a way down the road. I don't think we're close to that. I don't think we can do so that, that right now. So that would be a long-term plan. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, it's health care. You, you know, you can't ch turn a battleship on a dime. Mm -hmm. You know, you just can't change things. So, absolutely, you make improvements to the ACA, okay? And, you know, we put a plan together that says in 20-whatever, this is when we want to have the next rollout in health care. You give people time to talk about it and understand it. You know, you just can't go into office and say, Okay, ACA is done next week. We're going to roll out a Republican plan the week after. It doesn't happen like that. These are big plans that cost a lot of money and affect a lot of people. Okay, we had a health care change in my family the first of the year. My son has epilepsy and we, he takes pills every day. The pills for him for the quarter 
because they fell off a, a prescription list with my wife's health care, we have to pay $1,500 for those pills. You shouldn't have to do that. No. that that's incredible. You, you don't do that. And, and you see seniors having to pay more and more for their prescriptions, you know, giving them less okay. and less for food. Okay. The Democrats passed the health care, ACA, in yep. 2010 with a single Republican vote, okay? They didn't tweak the law, okay, right up until they just, you know, the Republicans, all right, in their wisdom said it's time to change it. So you had 24 federal exchanges, okay, the states are going into federal exchanges, yep. all right? 17 of them were either bankrupt or headed for insolvency. So the Democrats were reluctant to even change the medical device tax. Yeah. All right. They, they were they were reluctant to open up. Okay. They, they all believe in uh, you know uh, uh, free trade and everything else, but yet you couldn't buy a policy across a state line if you thought you can get a better deal in New York or anything it. else. So okay, I'm not saying what the Republicans did was right. Right. All right. But your own party failed to tweak the ACA. Okay, to make it, you know, uh, a, a better deal for business owners that you're so concerned about, for, for uh, Americans who are struggling, okay, working Americans who are struggling to get health care. All our health care costs went up yep. and stuff. We didn't get any uh, uh, benefits or subsidies from the federal government. So, I mean, in, in, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not blaming any Democrats or Republicans, but this seems to be the, the situation we just keep kicking the can, the can yep. down the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you going to be willing to make some stands on some of these things? I mean, when you see something, whether it's your party or the Republican Party, are you going to criticize your party and say, hey, this is not the right way to do things? Are you going to stand up or are you going to just stand in line with the Pelosi's or the... You stand up. You stand McConnell's up. McConnell's Because or, you know what? I have to come back to this district and I have to, you know, look the people in the eye and, and, and explain my vote. And I think you have to stand up because that's why we're in the position we're in today. People have not been standing up. People have not been governing. Okay, they're not doing the people's work. And you know what? When I get elected, I will get on there and I will stand up for the people of my district. And I want to listen to what they have to say. And you know what? I'll get out and vote based on what I'm hearing and what the people in this district are telling me. Okay? Because the reason people aren't speaking up has caused this problem, has caused the fact that now Democrats don't talk to Republicans. Their staffs don't even talk to each other. That's ridiculous. Okay? You need to stand up, you need to speak up, and you need to say, that's wrong, this is right, this is how we should do it, and at the end of the day, we have to at least talk about it. It all comes back to that. Okay? You member of Congress decided to resign um, from North Carolina. And he said, you know, people aren't talking about the facts. People aren't talking about the issues. And, and his frustration has led him to resign. And he's a Republican. You know, so it's on both sides. There's frustration on both sides that things aren't getting done. And, you know, those are the people that you want in Congress. You don't want a guy like that to resign because he's frustrated. You want a Republican like that who wants to talk, who wants to get the issues out. And you want a person like me in Congress because, you know what, I'm looking to talk to him. I want to see what he has to say. And that's where the conversation starts. So, you know, it, it has to start somewhere. Do you believe in term limits? Uh, uh, you know, I'm looking. If I get elected, if I'm lucky enough, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to stay there forever. And I know that's been, you know, that's been said. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, four terms, if I'm lucky... You know, look at my age and things like that, you know, so, you know, I, I just, you shouldn't be down there for 15, 20 years. You shouldn't be. You lose perspective, I think. Uh, I think you lose the edge. I think you lose the voice of the people. You know, I, I think it's important to have a good rotation. And I think when, when you're in there, you have to know when it's time to go. This uh, spending bill that was recently passed in Congress, it's, uh, I, I saw one statistic and, uh, uh, that it added $50 billion in interest 
in interest alone, an annual interest on the on America's already, I don't even know the figure anymore. Uh, trillion that, that dollars. Trillion dollar, dollar. Oh yeah, well, it's up to what, 20, 20, 20 trillion. 50 billion dollars. I can't believe that. Can't afford it. it, it you know, I look at the 3.3% mortgage I was lucky to get in on. Yeah. Okay, and it bothers me that they're going to pay that. Right. But, but fifty billion dollars, and they said not only now are we into the next generation of people who are going to have to pay our children, but the next next generation. Okay, yeah. but, I mean, where does it end? And this was both Democrats and Republicans, because yeah. the Democrats got one hundred and fifteen billion in new spending, and the, the Democrat, the Republicans piled on one hundred thirty-five <laughs> yeah. defense. Yeah. 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 defense. Yeah. So, so. We, what happened to prudence? I mean, and it, 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 prudence and responsibility was kind of flown out the window on that. And I think you saw that the night in Hudson. They asked about raising the debt ceiling, and many of the candidates raised their hand. I didn't raise my hand. I don't think it's right to raise the debt ceiling. We can't afford this. We can't uh, go on like this. It affects everything. Uh, you know, it affects, you know, looking at all the debt that everybody has. You know, we have to address that, and, and that's such a monumental number. It, it's staggering. Where do you begin? But you know, you have to begin somewhere, yeah. and, and it comes back to looking at all of these things and, and everything we're wasting our time on as a government. We're wasting time on federal investigations. We waste our time on memos and and, and everything that's going on in Washington. We're not focusing on the important things, the debt student education, jobs, infrastructure issues. We need to focus on that. And, and, and until we can get to that point, the debt's going to go up and we're going to be worse and worse day after day. So it, it, it all comes back to the conversation, being serious, governing and representing the people of your district. Because you know what? The people of the district, any district, want you to go to Washington and do your job. It doesn't matter if it's the 3rd District or the 4th District in Nebraska. They want you to go to Congress, they want you to represent them, and get the job done. Would you have voted to shut down the government because the deal my boss referenced uh, didn't address the Dreamers? And the, the state's congressional delegation, I'm sure you're aware, was split on that. I would have voted to shut down the government. You know, we need to do, you know, that seems to be hanging over our head every month. Oh, the Dreamers, we need to resolve the Dreamers. Uh, we're going to shut down the government if you don't. Okay, do it. Okay? But the, the weekend that that government shut down, everybody's in session and we are working on the Dreamers issue. And we're going to resolve this. And when the government, when that's resolved, the government starts up again. You, you need to take a position. You need to stand up. You need to speak out. Okay? We can't have the Dreamers issue linger on and on. There's, there's a deadline. For these people. But then does that become the new way of governing? No. Every time there's a crisis, you shut down the government? No. You tie it to that? We shouldn't be shutting down the government for anything. At some anything. point, the American people would, might think that was a good idea <laughs> and just say, keep it permanent. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, they might. Yeah. How, no, did, but, how did Nikki vote on that? She voted to. Um, she voted to the, the budget. The she budget, voted. right. Yeah. You know, we, we have to govern. We shouldn't be having shutdowns. Shutdowns, shutdowns are not the norm, they should be the exception to the rule. They seem to be the latest thing in the past five or ten years. That is not the way we govern. We're failing the people. If we can't govern, if we can't come up with a budget, and we can't pass a budget, and we can't move forward on immigration and big, big policies, we are failing the people that have elected us to be down there and represent them. But doesn't that contradict what you just said? That you said you would have shut down the government because you didn't get the deal in the dream. I want to shut. Uh, no, I want to shut down the government. We didn't get the dream. You know, I want to work on the dreamers issue. Okay, but I don't want that shutdown held over my head every month because you know that's what the Republicans want to do. We need to get back. We need to talk. We need to run government the way it's supposed to be run. We need to come up with budgets and and follow the process to get the budget through. Okay? We don't do shutdowns. That's not how you run a government. You know, you don't shut down your house. You know, you move forward, you make plans. Okay? I want to see the Dreamers issue resolved. And if it takes shutting us down for a month or, or, or a weekend or whatever that is, it has to be resolved. Okay? But next month, is it going to come up again? 
Is it gonna, is it gonna be held over people, the Democrats head again that we, you know, we're gonna shut down the government? Well, maybe we do. And like I said, while it's shut down, Congress is in session, everybody's in session, and we walk out of there with a resolution to the dreamers. And that's it, we move forward, we never have a government shut down again. Well, Terry, well, I thank you very much for coming in. It was a very good conversation. Thank um, you very much. I wish Appreciate you, uh, it. Wish you well going forward. Hopefully, we'll see you. Uh, the next time we'll see you, uh, we'll be our we'll, debate. We'll be running a, a series of debates. So great. Hopefully, we'll get those uh, dates set up and <coughs> shortly, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you out there also. <laughs> thank you.